Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, symposium by Thermo Fisher Immunodiagnostics Division, uh, as it will be known as of now. Uh, I'm really grateful for all of you to, for coming. I was outside about 10 minutes ago, and I was absolutely certain that there was not going to be a single soul inside this building. Uh, so it really demonstrates a very clear devotion to the cause. I think we have a great program, and the overall kind of uh, theme of program is this ever-changing, rapidly changing phase of allergy diagnostics. Uh, I will be talking about the dynamics of allergy march, if there is such thing as allergy march, uh, and then Paolo Matricardi from Charité in Berlin is going to address the development of IG responses throughout childhood, particularly in relation to the development of symptoms and atopy phenotypes. Uh, then Anna Novak version from uh, Mount Sinai in New York is going to talk about food allergy. And I'm absolutely certain that a lot of you will be quite interested because this is the area that was a beacon, really, that showed us all the way in how to interpret uh, the tests. And then, well, we have, we have respiratory pediatrician, hooray, <laughs> uh, Per Tungvist from uh, Uppsala in Sweden talking about furry animal allergy in kids and teenagers. And then at the end of it, I'm going to wrap it up. Just one kind of uh, tiny little mention. You all have evaluation sheets there. We would be very grateful if you could complete them, because it is important to have your views about it so that any future symposia can be organized in a much better way that really suits the audience, from which I learned a lot. I would like to ask all the speakers to take their places right here, take the chairs, and get ready for questions. I've been given a task to sort of sum it up, to say what this taught me. And really, for me, this whole presentation, set of presentations, was about rapidly changing landscape of allergy diagnostic testing. And for any diagnostic testing to make sense, it has to make clinical sense. It has to provide you valuable clinical information. Valuable clinical information, not only on the presence of symptoms, likelihood of clinical reactions, and perhaps even severity of reaction, but also clinically meaningful information on the progression, both in terms of resolution and persistence. And what I've learned today is that clearly not everybody joins this famous allergic march. But Paolo has outlined very clearly that remission of sensitization is intimately related to the level of IgE. And in Bansi cohort, certainly, certainly those children who went on and had remission of their sensitization had markedly lower Ig level too compared to children who had persistent sensitization. And similarly, data from Mass 90 cohort demonstrating pretty much the same, which is really interesting suggestion that there may be a threshold for persistence. Now, clearly, this will need to be confirmed in other studies, but I think it does offer you a valuable clinical information, a clinical information through which you can predict with greater degree of accuracy who are the children who are going to go on and persist with their symptoms as compared to those who have good prognosis, children who are likely to go on and have a remission of their symptoms. Uh, Paolo also had a passionate plea that it is not only testing at single time points, that really, to do justice to our patients, we should not only monitor their clinical symptoms through their childhood, but also their immune responses. Now, we know that majority, overwhelming majority of sensitized children do not have symptoms of allergy. And in my personal opinion, this is the study with almost each one of us shown, the famous study by Hugh Sampson, in my opinion, a real game changer. The first study to demonstrate conclusively a clear quantitative association between likelihood of clinical symptoms in this case within the context of food allergy and the level of specific serum IgE. For the first time, for us actually starting to look at the information on IgE in a in different light, not through cutoff points, not through classes, but looking at the actual levels, because that can help us make a meaningful clinical decision. 
and it has been recognized. It has been recognized in practice parameters, which Anna has shown us. But those practice parameters also outline clearly that alone these tests are not diagnostic of food allergy. Thus, whilst we can indeed increase our confidence of a diagnosis, we by no means can guarantee it. In my opinion, we can really have to move away from grossly oversimplified way we interpret these results. And this, I think, is what we should do be, be doing currently with the specific IG levels to whole allergen extracts. We should interpret them using the level of IG, not relying on just presence. And we should put that in the context of clinical history, but most importantly, put it in the context of patient, taking it into account gender and age, taking it into account patient's personal circumstances in terms of pet ownership, allergen exposure, other environmental exposures, put it into the context of respiratory virus infection and other environmental exposures, and I think in near future in the context of other tests. But situation is rapidly changing, and we are moving away from allergy diagnosis based predominantly on whole allergen extracts into what Pear has beautifully described, moving into the new era of component resolved diagnostic using allergen components rather than whole allergen extracts. Uh, in our hands and in our population within the UK, certainly in the context of peanut allergy, Measuring allergen-specific Ig to RIH2 has been an immensely useful tool in discriminating between true peanut allergy and asymptomatic sensitization. Uh, this is really the, probably the fastest translation from research finding into clinical practice that we had with our, with our own data, where probably within a few weeks of publication of a paper, we started using the information in our clinical practice. But be aware, it is our clinical practice, our population, and this may not necessarily apply to your population, certainly not in Southern Europe. Similarly, Anna has shown you the recent data from Japan demonstrating that within the context of soya allergy, it is a level of specific Ig to glyme 5 and glyme 6 that is associated with severe systemic reactions. And this is another one of Anna's slide, which I think is very exciting. And it is early days. We do not have solid data to substantiate it. Unfortunately, we still do not have solid data upon which we could predict the severity of clinical reaction. However, the body of evidence would suggest that the presence and the level of specific non-cross-reactive components for peanut RH26, probably in conjunction with H1 and 3, hazelnut, soybean, and wheat is associated with increased risk of anaphylaxis as compared to the presence of cross-reactive components. And if indeed this is proven to be true, then we will have much more meaningful clinical tool. And then I'm going to go to Pear's presentation uh, because he has shown us this first attempts and first data which are disentangling this complex association between different uh, furry animal allergens, those who are specific for different uh, species, those who are cross-reactive, and how you can use it in a clinical situation. I love his case. I love the case of Sven because I've seen so many Svens in my life. Because it is very easy for us to say based on skin prick testing or measurement of specific serum IG to whole allergen components, oh Sven, go away and avoid everything that has a little bit fur on you. Well, you know, Sven's sister has started to ride horses and it is important for her and it is important for family. And for me, the interpretation of a test, confirmation of dog allergies, and telling his sister that she can go on, ride horses, and that Sven probably is not, not going to have symptoms once she comes back home carrying tons of horse allergen on her clothing is very important, not only to Sven, but to her sister and to family as a whole. Has this all changed my clinical practice? 
Well, it certainly has. A few years ago, we've stopped our laboratory uh, sending us the results of tests as positive and negative. Then a few years later, we stopped them sending us results in classes, and we insist on having data in actual units. Uh, for me, in my clinical practice, our data on ROH2 has led to a major change in clinical practice, because this refers to my population, uh, my age group of children that we see. Very importantly, I think, it is, has to be said that in other populations, in other geographical areas, IGs to other components may be relevant. And there are excellent reports from Spain uh, imp uh, implying that it's allergen uh, Ig to RH9 that is associated with more severe reaction with this, within this context. We need information in different age groups, as Anna has pointed out, in different geographical location. This information will be specific to your own clinical practice and specific to individual patients. How do I use it? Well, these are two of my cases. First is six-year-old kid uh, who came to me with a history of first reaction after eating chocolate with nuts at the age of 18 months, second reaction with facial swelling and coughing at the age of 13 months, third reaction at the age of four years, again, marks facial swell swelling, vomiting, cough, no wheezing. Uh, at that time, prescribed EpiPen auto-injector, and then at age six, after eating biscuit with hazelnuts, having marked severe systemic reaction with wheezing, EpiPen administered with quick resolution of symptoms. Now, dear colleagues, do you need any tests to establish a diagnosis here? I mean, of course we don't. I mean, clinical history speaks for itself, and it is very reassuring that this uh, young lady has got very strongly positive high level of uh, specific Ig to RH2, but also 1 and 3, and all the skin tests are there. But she comes in a package together with her two and a half year old brother. Mother has been very careful not to have any nuts in the home. There is absolutely no history of exposure or reaction. He has had mild eczema, flare ups easily controlled with topical steroids, never had any lower respiratory symptoms. But mother is interested in only one thing is he allergic to peanut or not? Now, obviously, Anna is in a very comfortable situation in Mount Sinai where do, they do uh, double-blind randomized placebo control challenges in clinical practice. Now, how many of you do that routinely? Okay, two, not bad. Uh, very few other centers do. So what should I do? Should I do oral food challenge? Well, based on our data, we have now moved to the measurement of specific Ig to RH2. In this particular kid, it was high, and based on this, I was prepared, even in the absence of oral food challenge, to diagnose peanut allergy. It is this sort of clinical scenario where I find it really, really useful. So here we are in 2011. And we all still have to say that accurate diagnosis of allergy is very important, but challenging, really challenging. Now, I think that component resolved diagnostic measurement of IG responses to specific molecules may be in future useful in predicting presence, perhaps even severity of clinical allergens, and it may certainly be much better than currently used skin and blood tests to whole allergen extracts. But given the heterogeneity of component recognition patterns in different geographic areas, given markedly different exposures that your patients experience in different geographical areas, it is quintessential that studies are carried out in each of these individual areas in different age groups to identify and confirm potentially useful molecular diagnostic and prognostic markers. I think we are there at the beginning of new age of diagnosis. Uh, this is Japan. This is really rapidly changing picture from tsunami three months later. I wish, I wish that in no time at all, our understanding that is not crystal clear at the moment is going to become clearer. Because I think it is our patients who deserve that. And I think the day and age of 
doing the tests for the sake of doing tests is over. Do test by all means, but it has to mean something to the patient. Unless it means something to the patient and unless it has got decent predictive capacity, what is the point? And I think we are gradually accumulating evidence that will help you make these important clinical decisions. With that, I would like to thank all of the speakers for great talks. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Thermo Scientific Immunodiagnostic Division for sponsoring this. I would like to thank you all for being here. Uh.